Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 24th day of March 2024. We observe today as a kind of hybrid. It is Palm and Passion Sunday. Thank you for joining us here at St. Stephen Lutheran Church of Stowe, Ohio, where we are rooted in our tradition and open to yours. We begin this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Christ Jesus. Amen. You and I are held together this morning in God's mercy. So let us confess our sin in the presence of God. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in the snares of sin and cannot break free for ourselves. We tend to hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that would silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts, and we let our hurts grow into hatred. For all these things, gracious God, and for sins only you know, we ask that you would forgive us. Amen. Even in the midst of the Passion, there is a flood of grace for us. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us in this story and in this re-embodiment of who God is. God promises through the news of this celebration to break the snares of sin. God promises in the cross to wash away our wrongs and in the resurrection restore the promises of life everlasting through Jesus Christ. So, this morning's scripture readings are complicated. As Passion Sunday, we tend in worship to read from this year, the Gospel of Mark. We tend to read from chapter 14, verse 1, all the way through uh, chapter 15, or verse 47. It's a prolonged reading, and I would invite you uh, to read that for yourself. This morning, I am going to read from the 11th chapter of Mark, which tells us the story of the triumphal entry. This isn't the whole part of the story, but this is part of our scripture for this Sunday, and I'll read it for you now. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 11th chapter. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, uh, untying that colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the ground, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany, with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Now, as 
So I mentioned this is not the totality of the story for today, and I would invite you on the heels of that to, as you are able, read the 14th and 15th chapters of Mark uh, as time permits for you this week. So by now, you have the power of access. You are little more than a few taps and swipes, swipes and taps, away from every book ever written in your home. You can get to every song ever recorded and listen to it whenever you want. You have access. You have the power to get to every fact, half fact, quarter fact, and most non-facts parading as facts as humanly possible. And in this world of access, the message that is all around us and that you and I are absorbing, the one that we hear every day about our access and our power is indulge. Indulge, indulge. You have access, you have power, you know how you feel, and you know what you want, so indulge. Never mind, child of God, that faith whispers something else entirely. You see, faith is in many ways a direct inverse to what we tend to hear every day in our neighborhoods and in our world. Except even for us, the world's voice tends to win out over the voice of faith. You and I would have to be incredibly prayerful. You and I would have to hand our whole self over to God. You and I would have to be incredibly motivated by our baptism to ever understand and to hope to know at all what God is up to because it is so other. Hey, I think God wants so much for you, love, hope, self-control, and so much more, but I'm pretty clear that it's a, a Sisyphusian task. It's hard living uh, in this world and at all wanting to be the other that God would grant us. Indulge, indulge, indulge. You have such power of access. And today's words are different. Uh, the words are self-control. The idea is self-control, a fruit of the Spirit. And hey, good luck. So I'm going to indulge myself and the self-control is going to be up to you. I have for you no less than seven sermon ideas. And normally in a sermon, I would whittle that down to the final one and just use that. But you're going to get all seven like you're drinking from a fire hose. And uh, I don't want you to indulge. I just want you to pick your favorite and to pray about it and to talk about it with somebody. And in picking your favorite, be mindful of how God can guide you into living it. And so in a world of indulge, you're going to have to be incredibly prayerful to narrow this down. Seven things are about to come your way, and it's going to be up to you while I indulge to pick which of those is the one that you're going to be prayerful about and take to heart. I don't know if you're ready or not, but here they come. Number one, this guy is Marcus Borg. Do you know who that is? You can probably tell because I don't know who else would have old books as a backdrop for their headshot, but this guy is a Bible scholar. Doesn't he just sort of uh, ring that bell of Bible scholar? Uh, Marcus is sort of known for uh, pushing the envelope, for writing stuff that's fairly out there. Ten years ago, uh, Marcus Borg wrote a short blog about this day, the day we're celebrating, Palm Sunday. And you can find this yourself because you have access. Marcus Borg, uh, Palm Sunday, a couple swipes and pokes and taps and you would get there. But in it, it says that by now, everyone knows the story of Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry. Basically, everybody alive knows this story. But what he wishes we knew and what everybody knew was the whole story and would live it. You see, every year at the Passover, there was always a procession into Jerusalem. What Jesus is doing is doubling up in the year he enters, but in Jesus' lifetime, there was always a procession into Jerusalem. And I don't know how often we hear that. In the year Jesus wrote in, there would have been two, 
but every year a Roman imperial procession rode into Jerusalem, uh, afraid of upheaval at this high holy day and this high holy place. And so they would ride in with all sorts of soldiers and equipment and in power and in order to intimidate and to keep this holy city under heel and calm. Now remember, Jesus' ride in was on a donkey. Pilate's ride in was on a war horse. And these are two very different entrances and proclamations. One is about peace and one is about power. One is about self-control and one is about indulgence. And the story in the church is about how God chooses love and hope and subtlety, peace and self-control instead of violence and domination. Now, if that conflict still exists in any way, which way are we going to go? Which way is the world going to go? Is it going to break down? Which triumphal Jesus entry are we going to adhere to? If that conflict still exists, it's important to note on this Palm Sunday that God picks the peace and the hope of Jesus' entry. What would this mean for us? What would it look like for us to eschew power for peace? So that's number one. I'm just going to indulge myself and give you all the ideas. And it's up to you to pick which one of these is the one you're going to be prayerful about. Uh, and the first one is, uh, I'll call it Borg, Marcus Borg, peace instead of power. Here's number two. Hey, child of God, how many gospels are there? Today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a day where we tend to flatten and to harmonize the different gospel accounts, the four written accounts that we have, into one, instead of being good at noticing the distinctions. You and I have missed things. For example, and uh, you're only a few taps and swipes away from checking me on this, John alone talks about palm branches, the only written gospel where the word palm is used at all. Uh, and that's where we've taken today's name in practice. Today's processional gospel and gospel reading itself comes to us from Mark, and Mark does not mention palms. Mark says leafy branches that people cut in the fields. Matthew also says branches, not having the word palm, just saying branches. And incidentally, Luke doesn't mention anything at all. There's no mention of palm branches at all there. And so churches over time have tried to sit in this distinction as the lectionary rolls around on different Palm Sundays. To sit into and reflect on this variance, to try to embody it, some congregations have begun this uh, leafy branch practice, using branches native to their own ecology in their processions. I guess for us that would be like a, a stick off of a tree because it uh, still feels like winter. That's what we would have to use if it was to our local ecology. But what's happening is these places are trying to make this procession not just a story, but make it real. And incidentally, since garments are mentioned consistently, more consistently than the branches across the Gospels, some communities have also begun a tradition of on this day, uh, instead of focusing on just the story, also gathering clothing donations to make it an echo and an extension of the action of the crowds in Jerusalem and of our own lives. A way of uh, figuratively laying our garments before Jesus, collecting clothes and donating them. And so at sermon number two here, I asked you how many gospels there are. And the truth is, is that uh, there are more than four. There's the gospel that God pronounces every day, and so we are the gospel as the baptized ones. And this isn't just a story, it's that, but it's also the way God acts. And so the question is, how can we live this? And that's the question for people who pick sermon number two, leafy branches, giving instead of getting. Maybe that's the one for you. Maybe you liked number one, maybe you liked number two. I'm indulging myself, you're picking. Number three. The first hymn we sing today in worship when we gather is called All Glory, Laud, and Honor. That's the first hymn we sing every Palm slash Passion Sunday. But how much do you know about this hymn? Do you know that it's based on Matthew 21? Ever think about where hymns come to us from? 
This hymn was originally written in Latin by Theodolf, Bishop of Orleans, in 820 AD. At St. Stephen, we don't sing the Latin version, that would just be silly, uh, but that's its origin. We sing the English version, but its origin is in Latin all the way back to 820. And the thing about Theodolf was, he was in prison when he wrote this. Theodolf had backed a theological idea that was not popular, and it got him in trouble. It had something to do with icons. And maybe even worse, he had backed a political rival that did not win. And so, as Bishop, who had backed some of the wrong things, he was in prison, potentially facing death, and it was Palm Sunday in 820 A.D. While he was in prison on that day, the procession of palms went under his window. And while in prison, facing death, uh, he was inspired to write All Glory, Laud, and Honor, this great, well-known hymn, and it was written in prison. And the thing is, is that the way this story goes is that when those imprisoning him came to his cell and found and then sang this piece of music that he wrote, they were so moved that Theodolf, Bishop of Orleans, as troublesome as he was to them, was actually released because of this piece of music. Which is to say, maybe music really does change things. And what would it look like if you were to sing into the face of fear and melancholy of our world? This is uh, choice number three. You only get to pick one. Don't pick all of them. Uh, this is all glory, laud, and honor, music instead of melancholy. Number four is Bar Abba. Bar Abba. Number four, you'll have to decide if you like this one. One, two, three, or four. This one is Bar Abba. Barabba is about the character in today's prolonged gospel reading, Barabbas. Barabbas is Jesus Barabbas. He's uh, another character. He's a revolutionary character in today's text. Now, my name is John. Nice to meet you. I'm John. When you hear that name, do you often think about what the name John means? Do you even know that? I've been told all my life, my mom's always told me, uh, that my, my name means gift of God. So when you hear John, do you think gift of God, or do you think John and never worry about it? Your name probably means something too, by the way. Uh, but the thing is, is that in Jesus' world, in Barabbas' world, in the world of this story, their names and their meanings were much closer to the surface. And so Bar Abba says something. Bar means son of. Abba means father. Barabbas' name is literally son of the father. And in this story, when the crowds select Barabba, Barabbas, instead of Jesus, they're picking the guy whose name is son of the father instead of the actual son of the father. How often do we make similar mistakes? choose the sort of uh, easy way instead of the real thing? What would it look like for us to choose uh, peace instead of power? What would it look like for us to uh, choose the substantive instead of the simulation? And how might you prayerfully do that? Hey, this is me indulging all the ideas I had. I've given you one, two, three, and four. I have a few more, uh, but it's up to you, and I think you should pick one of these. Uh, but that was number four. Number five, in it, uh, I'd like to ask you if you've heard anything at all yet about uh, Monday, April 8th. Have you heard about this? Have you heard that there's going to be eclipse? Right? Yeah, there's no way you haven't heard that, right? I've heard that as this eclipse uh, is total, uh, and as it moves across the United States, that there will be something like one billion people who will travel from where they are to get into one of these places that the total eclipse is happening in. And I don't know if you know this or not, but the total eclipse is going to go right over our heads here in northeastern Ohio. Whether we're able to see it through all this wintry bluster will be another thing, uh, but it's going to go right over us. And something like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are going to come into this area to see it and to witness it. From 1901 to 2000, there were 228 eclipses. Some of them were total, which means the sun is completely blocked out by the close up to us moon. Some of them were partial, the moon just sort of touched the path. Some were annular, which means the moon is far away, it's too small to block out the whole moon, or the whole sun, so there's just uh, a sort of dot in the middle. 
some are hybrid, like a little bit of both, depending on where you are. Uh, from 2001 until the end of our century, uh, or sorry, the end of our millennium, uh, there will be 224 eclipses according to science. There were 228. I mean, should we be afraid there's less now than there were? Uh, the next total eclipse that comes anywhere near us in the United States will be in 2044. Have you heard about Monday, April 8th yet? The synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each tell us that at uh, Jesus' death there was an eclipse. And maybe that's saying something to us. This story of eclipses, and one that we're about to experience. Because every day, people all over the world, all over this community, our own neighbors, our own family, sometimes maybe even we ourselves, people all over the place pray that darkness will not overcome us. Some of us are barely holding on. There are those who kind of come at it the opposite way. That light will continue to shine on them. That no eclipse would befall them. But we know that it sometimes does. And here's the thing. 228 in the last millennia. 224 in this one. Uh, one at Jesus' death. And maybe that was the uh, quintessential eclipse. But never lose sight of the idea that every eclipse so far has ended. Every night has seen its dawn. And so maybe God's encouragement to you today is to hold on. Here's another Palm Sunday, and they keep coming, and God has always foreseen to that, and God loves you, and maybe this is an encouragement to hold on. And this is little uh, me indulging myself sermon number five, 224 of them, and it calls us into shining in the face of shadows, if you like that one. Number six is, uh, moves forward a little bit. It talks about uh, the end of World War II, when a small scrap of paper was smuggled out of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Nazi prison cell. He himself had been imprisoned for his participation in a plot to uh, assassinate Adolf Hitler. And his imprisonment led to his execution a few weeks before the end of the war. Bonhoeffer was a very religious, uh, very uh, influenced by Martin Luther man, and he did not appreciate how easily the church was standing by while what Hitler was saying was so clearly wrong. And so Bonhoeffer ended up trying to uh, actively participate in getting rid of Hitler, and he was captured for it and would ultimately be put to death for it. He left behind a young fiancé and a family. And today I'm thinking about uh, this uh, piece of paper uh, Bonhoeffer had scratched. Uh, Only a suffering God can help us on a piece of paper, and it was smuggled out of his prison cell. He was a, formerly a young pastor that left an academic post in the safety of New York to found and lead uh, the Confessing Church, and he was a faithful Christian who actively participated in resistance in Germany. He was a 20th century prophet and martyr. And these are the six words that he uh, smuggled, some of the last words that he wrote as a prolific author uh, that had smuggled uh, out of his prison cell, a deplorable prison cell, knowing that he was facing his own execution and watching his country torn apart. These are the words that he smuggled out that only the suffering God can help. He's finding comfort in a God who looks different than the one that the world is all the time talking about, one who suffers. Bonhoeffer realized that he had a cross to bear, Number six, and he realized that in his suffering, he meets the full story of God who suffers. And so with sermon number six here, uh, I'm going to call it a small smuggled scrap. And it's about embodying love in the face of evil. And the idea here is, is what can you do to not waste your suffering? To be prayerful about it and interact with others, uh, not being embarrassed, but living into it. Don't waste your suffering. That's number six, and I'm indulging myself here. You have to pick one. Number seven is, uh, well, what is today? Today is uh, Palm Sunday, right? But today is also the feast day who, that commemorates a man named Oscar Romero, who is the martyred Archbishop of San Salvador. 
All the saints in the church get their feast day, the day on which they are commemorated, and today, March 24th, is Oscar Romero's. It's not just Palm Sunday today, it's also Oscar Romero Day. Back on the 23rd of March in 1980, uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero delivered a sermon in which he called on Salvadorian soldiers as Christians to stop carrying out the government's wishes uh, of killing and oppressing uh, innocent people. And so on March 24th, the day after, in 1980, Romero was celebrating Mass at a small chapel uh, in a hospital, and uh, this was a, actually a hospital that had an oncology unit, and he was offering Mass there. And while he moved from the pulpit to the table to continue the service and began the process of offering mass, a red car came to a stop on the street in front of the chapel. A gunman emerged from the vehicle, stepped into the door of the chapel, and fired as many as two shots, at least one, and Romero was shot in the heart, dying in this uh, chapel uh, that day, March 24th, 1980. Oscar's killer was never brought to justice, and uh, a few days later his funeral became the site of all sorts of other violence, and other people died at his funeral because of the turmoil uh, that, that uh, El Salvador was in. But uh, citing Oscar Romero, the U.S. and countries around the world on this day stopped all their military aid to El Salvador because uh, of their willingness to shoot an archbishop at mass simply because he was asking people to no longer shoot others. And so maybe we want to reflect uh, today on the command to love and how dangerous that can be. Jesus understood more than those around him that in undertaking his work of love, he risked things. And in our world where everything is about indulge, 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 to undertake self-control uh, and to love differently is definitely to risk uh, looking odd at the very least. And so that's number seven, Romero, love in the face of loss. Today's words, today's idea is self-control, and I have given you no less than seven sermons on that. Uh, and today, for a world of power and typing and tapping and swiping, you got all seven. I've indulged myself. You've gotten so many stories from me. And you'll have to be the prayerful one. The one that practices critical thinking and self-control, and that'll be on you. While I've indulged myself, uh, you're going to have to be the faithful one. Yours is the job of self-control, and I believe only Christ can guide you. May you prayerfully pick one of these seven sermons. Borg, Leafy Branches, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, Bar Abba, 224 of them, A Small Smuggled Scrap, uh, Romero, and Live Into It. As countercultural as it might even be, may you even be prayerful of how you may practice uh, what this preaches. I've replicated the fire hose of information that is at our fingertips at any given moment. Now you be the one to live differently. You pick. Do it carefully and prayerfully. Do it by Christ alone. But pick one. And then pick someone to tell and talk about it with. Pick a way for the Holy Spirit to help you live into your selection. Amen. Let us pray. We praise you, loving God. You are the Redeemer of the world. And you come to us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, he entered into the holy city in triumph. He enters into our sanctuary and our lives in this way, too. We know that the story tells us that he was proclaimed the Messiah and that he was called king by those spreading garments and branches along his way. We ask, gracious God, that you would bless us, those who carry branches where we go. We ask that you would grant us grace to follow our Lord in the way of the cross so that joined to him in a death like his, we may be joined to him in a resurrection.
like his. Today we enter into life with you, and we ask you to send your Holy Spirit and to fill us. We ask all of this through Jesus Christ, who lives and who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. So whichever of those seven options was your selection, I would invite you to be prayerful, to enter with Jesus into Holy Week, and to ask God how you may live that little vignette through the rest of the days and hours of this time. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.